Coming up, a walk in Israel called the Jesus Trail, and archaeologists unlock a secret from ancient Jerusalem. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. Really glad you joined us today. Always, every day, we're glad that we people join us. We are always glad. <laughs> we don't want to be doing this alone, right, Phil? Exactly. <laughs> you know, we love Israel. And here's a fun fact. Okay. Did you float in the Dead Sea when you went there? I did. I did, too. It, it's quite an experience, right? It is. If you, if you have a few nicks, that salt is a little, it stings a little, but <laughs> the floating true. is pretty cool. <laughs> it's so true. Well, the Dead Sea is the Earth's lowest point, as we might all hmm. be familiar with. The sea's elevation is 430 meters or 1,412 feet below sea level, and it's the world's deepest hmm. salt lake, too. Interesting, eh? Very interesting. That's deeper than three lengths of a soccer field. What do you know about soccer fields, <laughs> well, Bill? Well, I, I don't know if you watched any of the Euro Cup. Pretty big deal in my house. But again, I, I realize how passionate people are about their identity in sports and their colors and their team. And I think it's because if you know where you came from, it helps you know where you're going and who you are. And I think that's why we study Israel. I, you know what? I think that's so true. And now, <laughs> watch this, a discovery of a rare bronze oil lamp in Jerusalem that clues us into early Roman life. Israeli archaeologists excavating in the city of David uncovered a rare bronze oil lamp buried in the wall of a building along the route. We have to remember that after the destruction of 70 AD, the entire city of David's hill that we stand on top of it now, it was no longer part of the city, but the importance of the area again is the water uh, in the Siran pool. This is the pilgrim's path that led from the Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount during the time of Jesus. After the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Romans still guarded this path so they could access the water in the pool. It's in one of their buildings that archaeologists found a treasure. The Romans uh, themselves uh, built uh, the structure to guard uh, the water. So we started excavating the structure and within one of the walls of the structure, we found half of a bronze oil lamp in the form of a theater mask. Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist Ari Levy, who leads the excavation along the pilgrim's path, said the half lamp is shaped like a grotesque face and is cut in half. The lamp itself was inserted to the wall of the structure as a foundation deposit in order to give luck and to protect the structure itself and the people that lived within the structure. Levy said the lamp could be filled with oil and lit, but it's rare because it's made as a half lamp and they didn't find the other half. You can theoretically take the other half, connect it, and it will appear as a full face, or you can put it on a wall just this F and to light it. Levy said it shows the significance of the structure. It's very symbolic, the oh. shape itself and also the location where it was found. The people that lived there needed the water, but they needed to protect the way to the water. It's very exciting. You do not find a, a find like this every day, not every year, not every decade. It's, uh, it's like a one-time occasion. He said they have uncovered about 120 feet of the Roman building, and they'll keep digging, hoping maybe to find the other half of the lamp. Julie Stahl, CBN News, along the pilgrim's path in the city of David, Jerusalem. Fascinating, isn't it? At the time of Jesus, Romans ruled Jerusalem, and Jesus warned his disciples of a time when all of Jerusalem would be destroyed. In fact, in Luke 21, 6, Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Well, it's pretty clear today's archeological discoveries are uncovering the story of the Bible, literally. The oppression of the Romans on the Jewish nation led to a great revolt in 66 AD by the Jews. And it appeared they were winning but in 70 AD, the Romans attacked with a vengeance and in fulfillment of Jesus' words, the city was in fact a pile of stone upon stone. You know, we have to heed the words of scripture. And Jesus also uh, told us there would a time will come when he will return. And we can be sure 
that his words are true. Luke 21, 36 says it this way, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So I don't know about you, but as I see the Bible come to life, it makes me pay attention and heed the words of scripture and certainly the words of Jesus. We have a resource for you called 10 Ways You Can Pray for Israel. I find this actually, when I was looking through it, a really great prayer guide. So why don't you give us a call at 1-855-759-0700. We'll send you this uh, free resource. And now Bible teacher Joe Amaral, he adds some historical context to the scriptures. Watch this, it's amazing. Now, usually in a, in a church setting, this is the part of the, uh, the sermon the ladies love because we're talking about the gifts that are left for the bride. You see, after the betrothal process begins, let, let's kind of review real quick. He comes in, he makes a covenant with the father, he makes a price for the bride, that's settled. He pours the cup, he drinks the cup before he knocks on the door and comes in and he sits with her. He does all of this, this is all done. Now what happens, okay, they, they never talked before, they never saw each other until the moment she opened the door. That was the first time they saw each other. And now, after she said yes to him, he's gonna go away for anywhere from eight months to 14 months, because he has to go now and build a home for them to live in. I mean, you talk about the ultimate dating system. As a father who has a beautiful daughter, I love the system. They don't see each other for 16 months at a time, not until the wedding day. But th there's a point to this, this uh, th there's a purpose for why we're talking about this. Okay, so the guy is gonna go away for a very long period of time. How does he know that she's gonna be faithful? How does he know that she's gonna be thinking about him? So they came up with a very, very simple uh, response to that. This tradition arose where, as the man, before I would go away to prepare the new home for my bride and I, I would leave a gift for her. And this was the whole point of the gift, that every time she used that gift, it would force her to think about me. And when others saw her using the gift I gave her, it would remind them as well, she's betrothed, she's taken, she belongs to someone. So sometimes the man would leave jewelry, maybe it was makeup, maybe it was clothes, but here's the bottom line. Every time she would use the gift, she would put on that makeup that he gave her, or he, she would wear that dress or put on the jewelry. She couldn't help it. She had to think of the giver of the gift. Now look at what the Bible says in John. It says that he is going to go away, but he is also going to give us a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians also talks about other gifts that were given to the church, to the bride. If I could look to that camera and see you, I would ask you, how many of you have a gift from God? And I would say, I'd like to see every hand raised. We've all been given a gift from God. But what's the purpose of that gift? Why does he give it to us? It's not so that we can fight amongst each other. Oh, I'm a prophet, I'm a this, I'm a that. No, no, no. The whole point of the gift, guys, is to turn the attention of those around us to the giver of the gift, amen? So now I give her the gift and I go away. And traditionally, I go back to my father's house and there he has a large piece of land and I have some options. I can either add on to the home he has already, make a room there for me and my wife, or I can go somewhere onto his property in his field and, and build a brand new house. And look at how this lines up with what Jesus says. Look in John chapter 14, verses two and three. And it's almost comical when you understand that he's speaking as a groom to his bride. In my father's house are what? Many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to what? Prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. I mean, guys, do you see the parallels? I don't think I have to make too many comparisons. I don't think I have to work too hard to make them a reality. They're there. But it all stems from the same thing that we've got to understand the culture of the time. We don't look at weddings as they are today, but we look at them as they were in those days. And as we do that, we understand that the groom will do everything necessary for his bride. He will make all of the provisions. He will pay the price. He will keep his covenant. He will be faithful to us. And we in turn are called to use our gifts to show others that we are faithful and committed to him. I'm Joe Amaral.
For 2,000 years, Christians have made spiritual journeys to Israel. Today, most visitors travel in tour buses. Now, there is a way to literally walk where Jesus walked. The Jesus Trail, a four-day trek, offers a chance to slow down and absorb the sights and sounds of the Galilee, where Jesus lived and ministered. Co-founders Israeli Maoz Inon and American David Landis are experienced international hikers. They say creating a Galilee trail where Jesus walked was just natural. It just seemed to make a lot of sense of how the Jesus Trail could bring a lot of new life to the Galilee, um, transform the communities, and give people, Christians, um, or just travelers and pilgrims, a way to really experience the life of Jesus in an authentic way that was very meaningful to them. Marked with orange and white stripes, or an orange dot, the trail begins in Nazareth, now the largest Arab city in Israel. A guidebook, map, or GPS coordinates help show the way. The 36-mile trail winds across natural terrain, through towns like Cana that are full of history, and over land with spectacular views. We think it's, it's very similar to the way Jesus would have walked. Um, from the Bible, it talks about Jesus going from Nazareth to Capernaum. On the first day, hikers come to the ancient town of Sipori. While the city is not mentioned in the Bible, it would have been under construction at the time of Jesus. Some scholars speculate that Joseph, and maybe even Jesus himself, worked there as builders. This part of the trail is about a day and a half's journey from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. It's on the way to an ancient Roman road. It's likely Jesus took that road on his way from Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee. I think it's just interesting to think about how connected Jesus' geography was to the rest of the world during his time. Just the influences he would have had, the different languages he would have heard. This Roman road was part of an ancient trade route connecting Egypt with Damascus and Mesopotamia. Today, it's covered with weeds, but still located near a major travel and transportation junction in the Galilee. Think of like how the internet connects people today. Like that's how Roman roads connected people during, during the, the time of Jesus. Nature is also part of the Bible story. The locust John the Baptist ate were probably caribs from a tree like this. Jesus cursed the fig tree when it had no fruit. And olive trees are biblical symbols of beauty and prosperity. Their fruit gave oil to anoint the priests and light the temple. By the third day, hikers get their first glimpse of the Sea of Galilee. The volcanic mountain, known as the Horns of Hittim, is the site of an ancient battle, which led to Islamic forces dominating the Holy Land and reconquering Jerusalem. From here, you can see basically most of the trails are out. You can see the area of Jesus' ministry along the Sea of Galilee here, and you can see um, the end point of the trail, which is Capernaum. You can sit under a tree in the shade and just um, look at where you've come and think about where you're going. This is Mount Arbel. The cliff towers more than 1,000 feet above the Sea of Galilee. In Jesus' day, there was a Jewish town here, and travelers crossed through the valley below on their way from Nazareth to Capernaum. Next, you'll go to the traditional site of the Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount. The last stop is Capernaum. Peter lived here, and Jesus used the town as his base during his years of ministry in the Galilee. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. So far in the last year, an estimated 1,000 people have walked the Jesus Trail. Landis says he thinks the number could grow to 100,000 each year as more and more people come to Israel to walk where Jesus walked. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, The Galilee. As I was watching the video about the Jesus Trail, I got thinking about pilgrimage. And a pilgrimage is simply a spiritual journey. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a physical pilgrimage or not, but the Bible actually tells us that we are all on a spiritual pilgrimage. It's called your life. I don't know if you ever thought about it that way, but your life is a spiritual journey. And just like every journey has a starting point, for us as followers of Jesus, there comes a point where you realize, I need to follow him. Jesus stepped into this world and he invited us to follow him and he promised that he'd give us a full life. 
And so somewhere you made a decision about who you were going to be or become. Have you made that decision to follow Jesus? That's a great starting point. But then also every journey is a process. Um, there's a process of moving from one place or point A to point B. And in that, you have to make decisions and you have to make right steps that get you to where you want to be. And so you had to make choices and sacrifices along the way. I know maybe in your life like me, you're tempted to quit or turn back or maybe encouraged to press on. So in your journey, do you know where you're going and are you willing to take the steps to get there? But also every journey has a destination. I mean, if you don't know where you're going, that's kind of aimless and wandering. You don't want to do that. So for us as followers of Jesus, we know we have a destination. It's heaven. And we don't know when that's going to happen, but we are grateful because we know the choices we make today will determine what our next step or eternity is really like. So that's what I love about this, this idea of pilgrimage and the story of Israel. And we'd love to pray with you in your journey as well today. Why not call us at 1-855-759-0700, and we'd love to put this pamphlet in your hand, 10 Ways You Can Pray for Israel. Well, we're going to be right back to pray for your needs. I'm Julie Hunter, Executive Director of Windsor Life Center. I would like to say a personal thank you to 700 Club Canada and its partners for helping us to reach out to broken, hurting women caught in the throes of addiction. We see lives changed daily with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Women who come in hurting, broken, and upon graduation have hope for their future, leading productive, fruitful, healthier lifestyles, breaking addictions for generations to come. Thank you so much, 700 Club partners. We are truly grateful. May God bless you. It's been a great reminder today. I know both of you and I have been to Israel. I want to go on that hike. <laughs> I really do. I think that would be a great way, like you say, to pilgrimage. Can I take an electric scooter? Well, no, you can walk, Bill Marco. I mean, wouldn't that be a fun way to see it? I agree. And, yeah. and actually to think you're stepping where Jesus stepped. Yeah. That would be really cool. Yeah. And it's time to reflect. Like, we, as we think about Israel, you said at the top of the show, just about identity. Like, explain that a little bit more. Well, I think if, again, you know who you are, it gives you security and safety. Um, so for me, in my family, we talk a lot about our heritage and our history, how we got here what we believe and what we value. And I think as followers of Jesus, we believe God is our Father. And so He gives us our value and identity and direction. And so what I mean by that is by looking at who Jesus was and where He walked and the history that we find in the Bible, yeah. it reminds us, okay, that's what Jesus was about. So we're about that too. Yes. Healing, yeah. reconciliation, yes. peace, those yeah. beautiful things. Yeah. So, And that's our Judeo heritage. Exactly. And I think that's such a great point. And one of the things Jesus did was pray. And yes. he tells us to pray. So we yes. want to pray now for you. And Samuel sent a request and said, please pray for my marriage. It's collapsing yeah. and I need God's intervention. I just want to say, I think there's others watching. This could be your request too. Yeah. And Victor yeah. asked us to pray that the Lord would provide a good job mm. for him. Yeah. And so let's just pray. God, thank you so much that you give us our identity. This world will try to force us, squeeze us, crush us into something that we were not designed for. But if we ask, God, you set us free. And so we just pray today for all of those listening that whatever their need, wherever they're at, that you'd remind them who they are, that we can begin a new journey by trusting you and following you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I lift up Samuel's marriage and yes. others who are watching where they're feeling their marriage is collapsing. Lord Jesus, would they welcome you, the healer, into their marriage? Would you heal marriages across our nation? Would you strengthen marriages across our nation to your glory for your namesake mm. in Jesus' name? And we also pray for Victor too, yes. to provide him a job, Lord, because you love to meet all our mm. needs in Jesus' name, amen. So good that we can come to God with anything, Bill. Like he's a good dad, that's our identity as his child. He says, come as a child, ask me for what you need. And I think prayer changes us, yeah. and that's the true miracle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now, what does it mean to seek and you will find? 
I guess we're going to find out. <laughs> You know, Philip is one of the most interesting and one of my beloved characters in the New Testament. He's willing to go anywhere and do anything that the Lord tells him to do. He's, he's so enthusiastic about what the influence that Jesus has had in his life that he's just, he's just wherever you want me to go, I'll go. And so in Acts chapter 8, we have this story about Philip being told by the angel of the Lord, well, on the road to Gaza, I want you to go down there and just just walk. So he does exactly what he's told. And as he's walking, uh, there's an Ethiopian eunuch who's come up to worship the Lord for one of the feasts. And he's on his way home. And in, as he's riding along in his chariot, he's reading Isaiah. And the Lord brings Philip alongside of him exactly when he's in Isaiah 53. And he's reading the verses where he said it, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears was silent, so he opened not his mouth. And in his, in his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his de generation? For his life was taken from the earth. In this prophecy about the Messiah and about the Messiah's suffering, uh, he, the Ethiopian eunuch has no idea what he's even reading. So he asked Philip, to come alongside and sit with him and explain the scriptures. And as they go along and as Philip opens up and explains how the prophets um, foretold about a suffering Messiah who was supposed to die for the sins of the people, they come along a spring. Now the springs in Israel are not very often. You don't have a lot of spring water. So as they are on the road uh, to the to, towards Gaza, he says, well, what keeps me from being baptized? And here's a Gentile who would be considered distant from the co community of faith, which was basically the Jewish people at that time. This is before Cornelius and before things opened up to the Gentiles. So Philip is already ahead of the curb on this. And Philip says, there's nothing keeping you. And he takes him right down into the water, baptizes him, and then Philip is taken away and placed somewhere else, and he just keeps going where he's going. But, you know, the, one of the messages out of this story is that even if you feel like within the life that you're living, you're distant, you're far away, but you're still seeking, God brings people alongside us that can say, you know, this scripture talks exactly about this, and this is the path that God has chosen for your salvation. And those kinds of people, whether you can be a Philip to someone else, or you may need a Philip-type person to come alongside you, but God works all these things in a way to bring us all to the revelation of who He is, what He's done for us, and how a simple spring of water on the on the path that we find ourselves on, even if it's an arid area, can turn into the source of hope and salvation for us all. Well, we'd love to provide you with great resources. We have a new DVD to give to you for a one-time donation of any amount. That's right, any amount, any size of gift. And it's called Written in Stone, Secrets of the Second Temple. Take a look at this. It is the most important archaeological site. Nevertheless, it has never been excavated. An almost impossible task. Temple Mount was the largest religious compound in the ancient world. It is the most politicized piece of real estate in the world. Leads to an improbable find. There is an ancient road, also 2,000 years old. That is the building which is referred to in the New Testament that is confirming the stories of the Bible. Where did Jesus walk? There's no question he walked on these steps. You can see it. There's no way to refute that. They existed. They walked here. They talked here. See the evidence left by an ancient witness. He lived there. He saw it. He knew the details. And it's like the crown of our discoveries. May cause a rewriting of the history of the Temple Mount. And discover what was written in stone, Secrets of the Temple. Get your copy today for a gift of any dollar amount. Available now. You know what I love about the history of the Bible is it affirms and confirms what we believe, which again, 
root, is rooted in our identity. Mm -hmm. And so this DVD uh, is an amazing gift. Yeah. Uh, for any donation today, you can receive that. Just call us at 1-855-759-0700 and be encouraged and inspired that these things really did happen. That way you read in the Bible. That's right. It's true. It is true. And you know what? It's really well produced too, Bill. Like this DVD is pretty spectacular. So it will really draw you in, which I really appreciate the quality <laughs> of the, you know, the production. Well, and even the experts that are on there that yeah. give, that it's not just random people. These are people exactly. who are actually doing it. And so it's really exactly. powerful. Exactly. I hope you've really been encouraged by today's show with, so we look at Israel because I find, like you were saying, Israel really helped root and ground me in my, I, a greater understanding of my identity a greater understanding of Jesus, a greater understanding of Christianity, and of course, of you know where we all came from. Well, and you can't help but read the stories in the Bible and identify in some way with the characters found there. Yeah. And then when you know, well, these are actually real people, like me, yeah. it means that what happened for them can actually that's happen true. for me. That's true. And that's so powerful. And actually, speaking of God doing amazing things, we do have a praise report. Monica said, I got my test results back, and the doctor told me, that the tests were fine and that I am cancer free. Thank you for always praying for me during these difficult times. And that's so great. Isn't it amazing? Oh, Monica, yeah. high five to you. That's amazing. And thanks to our prayer team for praying yeah. and believing. And yeah. if you'd love prayer, we are here for you. Yeah, that's I think the backbone of our ministry too. Like if you've never called our number, I'm strongly encourage you to pick up the phone and call that number. Maybe you don't have a big prayer request, but it doesn't matter. God cares about every single detail of your life. And we're committed to journeying with you, to equipping you, and to praying with you. And we believe in the power of prayer. So don't hold back. Pick up the phone right now, if you like. Even while I'm talking, pick up the phone, and we're there for you. Absolutely. And our power verse to, from today is found in Psalm 118, verse 24, where it says, this is the day, and this is true, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it and not begrudgingly, right, Phil? <laughs> and no, exactly. So I hope that you find joy in your journey as you follow Jesus, being confident that what he said and what he did is 100% true and accurate for you. That's so good. Yes, yeah, so thank good. you so much for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. A wife must pray to save her marriage and her husband's life, and a couple gets a second chance to get their relationship right.